Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. It's good to be here with you again on OC Talk Radio. Now, today, I plan to dedicate our show to what I'm calling kind of an unsung but essential topic. I want to discuss the potential shortcomings related to economic and social aid to the developing world, or in old terminology, third world countries. Basically, the question is this. Is your investment in the poor and disenfranchised and developing world being administrated with longer-term needs of communities being considered, or is it more about short-term walk-away money? Big question. My guest, Daryl Larson, has vast philanthropical experience in several foreign countries, including Fiji, Philippines, and several countries in Africa. Uh, And both of us with hearts for developing the social change of, let's say, the most needy people in the world. Daryl and I spend our time, we'll spend our time today, discussing how oftentimes our desire to serve the poor and disenfranchised can frequently result in short-term benefit, but longer-term disadvantage. I recently watched a documentary that would be interesting to all titled Poverty, Inc., a quite um, informative and a bit disturbing documentary that develops a concept that's stated in Steve Corbett's popular book, When Helping Hurts. The thesis is this. If we give researches such as researches <laughs> resources such as money, or in my case with wells of life, uh, water wells, without empowering communities to assume responsibilities of these gifts that we have given them, the result can be a dependence on foreign aid instead of independence, self determination, and self respect. Like the familiar adage, we are giving them fish, but not teaching them to fish. Today, uh, Daryl and I are going to talk about the idea of projects with local communities versus projects to local communities. And I want to talk about three types of giving, and one is going to be a surprise to Daryl. I want to talk about relief giving, what that looks like, alleviation from poverty giving, And finally, developmental giving. My guest, Daryl Larson, is a seasoned vet in international affairs regarding poverty. He is currently international director of Sawyer Filters, which provides clean and safe water for thousands of homes across the world. Daryl is also founder of the nonprofit Give Clean Water and has served as outreach pastor at two churches in San Diego. I can't wait to get the show going. So let's bring on Daryl Larson. Daryl, welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. Hey, Charlie. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. I I, I can't wait for this discussion. Uh, Tell me something, man. You have a boatload of experience in addressing poverty and social uh, social issues in countries in the developing world. What is it, I'm curious, what is it that drove you to work internationally as opposed to focus on surfing on serving the the poor people in the United States. That's a good question, um, and I often think of it in terms of um, maybe not so much either or, but both and. So I have my hands a little bit in both, but predominantly on the international side. And I think the very first time that I um, got involved with it was I was working with youth groups and uh, teenagers specifically, and I was at a youth worker convention. And there was an opportunity during that convention to actually go down to Mexico and to build a house during that week for a family that was impoverished down there and didn't have a home. And And uh, I was always up for adventure, and I was actually kind of going with the purpose of kind of seeing with different eyes around the world and what the needs were around the world. And so this gave me a really hands-on opportunity to go. And, and I... I grew up in in San Diego and hadn't really gone down to Mexico very often. And it was so crazy that just crossing the border, we went out into this very, um, you know, just what were third world poverty conditions out on the outskirts of Tijuana. 
and went to a family's house and I saw people living in cardboard and plastic and could barely get by and they didn't have uh, appropriate ways to, you know, really take care of the family in terms of shelter and those kind of things. And so in the course of one week, we immersed ourselves into this house build. And when I left at the end of the week, we gave the keys of the house to that family. And I knew this was something that I wanted the, the kids that I was working with, you know, the students that I was working with, I wanted them to be involved in something like this because it was, I don't know, it's just something like you, you go through life every day and, and we almost lose our ability to see things that are around us. We, you know, we walk by things all the time, but something about going, crossing the border, being out of my comfort zone, seeing with different eyes gave me the opportunity to see the poor like I had never seen the poor before. And then I was able to go with an organization that was actually working with local people on the ground. And that was my first exposure to, to this idea of really, how do we do projects with people? So that, that kind of set the stage. That was back in 1991. And that really changed the trajectory of my life. You had to be a puppy. You're not that old, man. You had to be a puppy <laughs> in 91. Ah, no, I'm, uh, well, I'll turn the big 6-0 next year. No way! No way, you yeah. look so, you look, you look 15 years younger than that. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah. You, you know, I've, ex- I've experienced similar, similar, similar experiences since joining Wells of Life back in, um, March of 2017, and, and, I have an answer to that question myself, and they're really simple. Three, there are three reasons I am. It's not that I ignore uh, domestic need, but my my you know the mainstay of what I what my family uh, participates in is international need. And first is like you said, there is an acute poverty when you go into rural villages in outback Africa. You know, you're seeing. Something you just simply do not see here. You, you, yeah. you, you know, you're seeing poverty on a whole different level, and you're seeing the likelihood not just of making their lives better and getting them into college. You're saving lives. You're keeping people from dying. And um, also, secondly, the the vastness of international issues of need, and there is just a lack of aid by wealthy Western countries. I, I believe the United States, you know, n- not the government, but the donations in the United States, less than 4% of our donated money goes internationally. Um, so it's, yeah. it's really not a lot of money going there. And then the third thing is really kind of, it, it almost is, sel- I, don't, I don't want it to sound selfish, but it's, you know, I just call it quite simply, it's bang for the buck. I give five thousand dollars internationally, and it is equal to twenty five or fifty thousand dollars here. You know it just it goes so far and there, and and so far, and what I mean is it helps so many more people. There are so many individual lives impacted so i've you know I've become a real believer in international international service yeah it's a it is all those things, you know, you, you literally can go in and especially in, in what you guys are doing, whether or not you're drilling wells or you're putting water filters in, in a, sometimes a day, a couple of days, sometimes a few hours, you're going to go in and change somebody's life right there on the spot. I mean, they're going to be drinking bacteria soup every day out of the local river or the local creek. And with these kinds of interventions, you can go in, and the bank for the buck is incredible because you're going to affect uh, affect t- entire populations of villages, you know, home by home that are now going to br- be drinking clean, healthy water, and they're going to thrive. Their sicknesses are going to go away in, in a matter of a few weeks, and um, their babies will not die anymore. And uh, they'll get to grow up and see their next birthday, which is which yeah. And they is a get to go. Deal. They get to go to school, and and we don't have these diarrhea issues, you know, that that are just 
widespread. You know, we have, we have so many different things. And I want to talk to you about, you know, my audience is familiar with my wells of life and, and, and drilling of wells. Uh, you have a different protocol that you use with Sawyer filters. And we met late last year, 2019, late 2019, to discuss the use of, of the product that you are international director of, of Sawyer Filters, for 300 families in Uganda that we were serving that had no access for clean water for us to drill in. There were no aquifers. We couldn't drill water. We had promised them water, and we were just up a creek. And then you came along and said, hey, we've got these water filters that can serve your need and and." I would love to you ex- to explain Sawyer filters to our audience. Yeah. Well, Sawyer's uh, is actually an outdoor company here in the U.S. And so we have uh, primarily water filters, insect repellents, and uh, uh, we have some sunscreens and you know some first aid supplies and things. And so you'll find us in REIs and Walmart and Amazon, all those kind of places. But um, on the international side, we really focus on on clean water. We have a small little gravity-fed water filter. It's the number one filter out on the hiking trail, you know, the outdoor trekkers and everybody that that use it in the U.S., backpackers and everything. But this is, um, we've developed it in such a way where that small little gravity-fed filter can be attached to something like a 20-liter bucket, a five-gallon bucket, uh, which there's buckets in every foreign country. And you can literally take uh, water from any fresh water source, so a um, contaminated well. Or, yeah, filthy water you know, source, you know, a fresh water yeah. source, but it's a filthy water source. Yeah, just terrible. It's just like it is literally bacteria soup and coming straight out of a river, a creek, whatever the water source is. And in many of these countries like, you know, Uganda, Liberia, different places like that, they have lots of surface water that's available. And so... Um, the filter works with a, a technology called a hollow fiber membrane. Uh, they use hollow fiber membranes uh, in kidney dialysis, actually, to filter blood from pathogens and everything. But uh, this, this filter really functions, um, I, I like to say it functions kind of like a microscopic net. It has these little hollow fiber tubes, and the, and the pore size or the holes in it are so small 0.1 microns in size that that no bacteria can pass through that filter so all of the bacteria and everything larger than the bacteria actually gets filtered out and trapped inside the filter and uh, so you can filter a, a five gallon bucket in about 30 minutes and have potable water right on the spot and what's really great about the filters is because they're mechanical, there's no, um, there's nothing like carbon or anything like that inside the filters. It's literally a mechanical micro pore size. You can take water, and we give you a couple different ways to do this, but you can back flush or backwash this filter for years and years and years of use. And so uh, it's just such a simple little filter that's so profound. And every time I demo it or every time we take it to a village, and we take that dirty brown, you know, contaminated water and we, you know, filter it through a bucket. And then we take a drink, you know, often uh, that's, that's what we do in the village. You know, we'll take the first drink and, you know, people around the world, especially in Africa, they, they have started to name this uh, the miracle filter or the miracle bucket it, it, because it literally will change their lives right on the spot. Now I know you've you've you know one of your your center of operations is Liberia. How many how many filters you know individual family filters do you have in, in Liberia? Well, uh, we got involved with, with in Liberia in 2015. Actually, started installing filters in 2016, and uh, we this year were involved with a group that was that had a mission to get border to border clean water in every household for every man, woman, and child in Liberia by December of this year. And so we got involved with that, and through an anonymous donor, we we were able to bring 130,000 Sawyer filters into the most remote bush jungle villages, people that were off the grid, you know, places that you couldn't get to. You, you were talking about 
there are literally places that you can't get a well rig into. Right. And uh, these guys are way out in the boondocks. You know, you, you drive as far as you can drive. Uh, you cross a river and then you hike four to six hours into the middle of the jungle. And that's where these, the, the people groups were living. And so we have tracked them all and uh, we are on course this, this year, December of 2020, that Liberia will be the first developing nation with border-to-border clean water through a combination of, of hand pump wells that were drilled and repaired and 130,000 Sawyer water filters all throughout the country. That is amazing. That is so. That is so spectacular. So an entire country. Well, well here's something that will that will impress our audience. So tell me about the the change in waterborne diseases before yeah. and after the Sawyer filters. Yeah. So we actually spend uh, a lot of time teaching the nonprofits that we work with how to collect data. And so we were involved in a really big research project through some universities here in the state where all of the groups went out and they measured diarrhea rates, they measured purchase water costs, medical costs, uh, they measured uh, the work days that were missed by adults from waterborne sickness and the school days that were missed by kids. And uh, in Liberia, when we started out at the baseline, 36 percent of the homes in Liberia reported frequent diarrhea rates before they received the water filter. And when we say so frequent, we, we really mean frequent. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, that's three or more. What, what we would say in the academic world, it would be three or more loose stools per day. That would be the, the technical okay. term of how it's defined. Okay. And so, um, yeah, so that was going on at, at a 36% of the household rate. And uh, we tracked that, and we sent teams back out at, after two weeks of receiving the filter, and then they, they tracked the same questions. And then at the eight-week mark, they tracked the same questions. So we went from 36% of the households two weeks later down to 2.9% of the households. And at the eight-week mark, dropped all the way down to 1.5% of the households only with frequent diarrhea. And, uh, you know, you're not going to get rid of all the diarrhea from – from just cleaning up the water, but but a 95% reduction in diarrhea rates in just a few weeks. And at the one-year mark, one-year spot check, we even saw the zero- to four-year-olds go down into the 0.6% range, which was, um, you know, they're the most vulnerable. So, so you're definitely impacting dramatic. infant mortality then. Yeah, it's just a dramatic decrease in those kinds of sicknesses and, you know, the, the village is thriving. We did the same thing in the country of Fiji, uh, and a different university measured. Uh, they were focusing more on the economic benefits of the filter. And so between purchased water savings, medical savings associated with waterborne sickness, and work days that were recaptured by the adults, we found that we, with every filter that went in, we were able to put $52.96 per month back into the pockets of each Fijian family that received one of those filters. And what is their, is what is their, what is their income per month? Do you know? Uh, that's about, that's about for a, for a lower wage, you know, kind of minimum wage, kind of basic wage, that's about one eighth of their salary. And so very dramatic input. So for the cost, you know, filters don't even cost that much to put in, right? So right. the ROI, like you're saying, you, 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 with a minimal investment, the ROI is immediate, and within the first month, that's paid for. Now, the, not only are they thriving in a health sort of way, but they're also thriving with money they're saving for all these other things that they can now spend on school and education and food and different things like that for their family. So it's so many things that are affected when you clean up people's water. Oh, so many. You know, we, 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 think, about, we, we think about health and we think about... Uh, saving of lives, and you know who knows. You know it, it's difficult to measure how many lives are saved because that's like measuring a negative. But uh, there are there are just I'm sure tens of thousands of lives saved. But you know another thing that's I don't think mentioned frequently frequently enough is the whole quality of life. Back to work, back to school, no stunted growth. You know yeah. none of none of the disabling disabling impacts of of dirty water and you're you're impacting that tremendously i think it's i think it's incredible daryl what you guys are doing 
That's a super fun project. You know, we're in uh, we're in over a hundred countries, and um, oh, are you really? really? You're in one hundred yeah. countries. Yeah, that's where the, the Sawyer filters are being used all over the world. So, how and, much time uh, do you spend at home? <laughs> well, during this COVID outbreak, all <laughs> <laughs> uh, all my all my travel was canceled. But uh, last year, well, the last couple of years doing projects, I would say. Pretty much half the time I was gone, and uh, half the time here. And you know, the air miles rack up in the two two hundred thousand plus. You know, going all over the place. I just hit my fiftieth country this year. Fiftieth country total, or fiftieth country that, in a that year? That I visited. No, no, no total. Oh. It went to my fiftieth. Yeah. And yeah, so, you know, uh, I have yeah, that. I have. I don't have quite that many, but I have. Not too far from that many, but miners all pleasure. <laughs> I, I really love international travel. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's great. You know, let's let's. I, you know, that's kind of an overview of where we're going. I want to, uh, you, you know, uh, an overview of uh, of where we are. I want to get into the subject that is just so so poignant with me, so strong and. And and I am looking at I'm and I'm and I'm trying to find I'm trying to find you know I I have I had the, I had notes and and now and and I and I lost my 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 place in my notes oh oh here we go now as you and I have chatted in the last few days if we you and I and all. NGOs and supporters of not only international charities or causes, but same thing with national causes. If we are not careful, our giving can be severely limiting to communities when we give without any consideration of empowering these same communities to manage our gifts on their own, that these gifts become gifts, and they now become property, and we empower the people, and our role becomes to function as consultants and facilitators, not as the typical foreigner, deep pocket, we've got you covered, don't worry about it, we'll take care of all your needs. Because we're not really helping people when we do that, we're really disempowering them. And 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 actually, you know, losing aspiration, their, you know, self determination. You know, there, there's there's just so many negatives about it. Sure. Yeah, it's it is both internationally and locally. Um, you find that phenomenon, and I, and I, you know, I I always like to preface of, of the you know what we're talking about. There's always room for one of the great stories that I love uh, about the Good Samaritan who sees somebody in need and they, and this helps like right on the spot and, you know, takes care of this person in need. So there's always, there's always room for that. But the longer term development kind of, kinds of things, sometimes we can, we can, we can enable, we can, you know, go in thinking that we're doing something good when we're actually, we're, we're not really helping, but we can be hurting. And uh, oftentimes I find that when, when we go in, I've seen many organizations and stuff that will go in and they, they think of something they want to do, and it's, not, and it's always goodwill. Always uh, great intention. Do, great intention. Yeah, great. Yeah, they want to do something well. They want to use their skill sets and those kind of things. But but oftentimes we'll go in and, and what I would say, go do a project to someone. They're going to show up. They're going to do this thing, and it's going to be to them. And they haven't maybe um, worked with locals. Um, it's, it's, you know, you just give these free things away or whatever it is. And as a result, you you don't oftentimes even address needs that are real needs in the community. We can do it locally. You know, we, we're going to think that we're going to go down and do something to someone or give something away or something like that. And we haven't addressed what the real systemic needs are in the community and, and actually listened to the community and listened to what their needs are. And sometimes we'll find that uh, what we're doing is not, what is needed and so um i found it way more of a you know like what i would say a better approach to actually do things with people 
to listen, to do in this, you know, in the states we have a lot of community-based development that uh, seeks a lot of input from the communities and those kind of things to develop real real systems that will help, you know, in the long term. In, in international, we would do the same thing. You know, we want to involve locals in the project, so much so that really, I, I really believe that when we go and, you know, you're doing clean water projects, we're doing clean water projects with Sawyer, you know, well, whether or not it's wells, filters, or whatever we're doing. But when we do it, you know, we want to raise up uh, people that uh, can sustain those projects you know, you guys are, are looking at uh, building up local teams that know how to not only install the wells themselves, they've been trained to do that, but they know how to repair them. Uh, you, you look into maybe group savings accounts in villages where yes. villages can be a little bit more forward thinking and they can actually save in advance for some of those, you know, small repairs that in the past groups have gone in and maybe installed wells in different places and they didn't raise up locals that can sustain the project. And, you know, a, a $10 O-ring can go out in a well and it takes the whole pump out and it takes the whole village out with their clean water. And um, and so those are the kind of things where, where it's, you know, we somebody went in, they did a great project and it worked for a while, but how do we do a better job at sustaining things by building capacity in locals and listening to them and inviting them in the project and and then watching them actually grow creating uh socioeconomic opportunities for them small entrepreneurial businesses where they can long term sustain those projects and and care for their families in those kind of ways so those are two different approaches right yeah and um, both have good intentions but one actually has a longer approach you know, I've then, got two. I've got the, two comments on that. Yeah. Um, one is the district that we're doing a lot of our well, uh, a lot of we're going to be moving almost all of our operation restoration, which we go in and we restore, repair, rehabilitate wells that are non-functional. They are not wells of life wells that are non-functional. They've been drilled by other NGOs or by the government. Um, they're in this in this particular district. There are more than 300 um, non-functional wells, and some of these Mm -hmm. wells have been non-functional for a year. Some have been non-functional for 10 years, and sometimes Mm -hmm. it's a matter of $100 to fix them. It's just nothing, And but they've gone without water for all this time, and we're making that one of our main initiatives we're thinking for for next year is just making this a like you made Liberia a clean water we want to make it a all the wells are functional within a period of 4 years of trying to do 80 yeah. a year but but something something else occurred to me now back on the other subject about about working to rather than working with isn't that when we go in with our resources and our money and we build schools and we build wells and then we try to take control over them, try to manage them, is that not sort of a conflated process of colonialism? I mean, we certainly can go in and... um you know, almost create welfare societies yes. that are de- that are dependent on that. They can't stand on their own two feet, you know, or whatever, um, because we've created this system where we go in and, you know, may- perhaps Americans are managing everything and doing all that. And and it's it's okay to be like involved in the project and stuff, but you really want to empower and and equip and build capacity in those that live locally. So much so. Um, that if you were think about if 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 NGOs were to go in and, and do these projects and build capacity, if you were to leave, what would happen? And and some of the best NGOs that I know that their founders have gone in and done great work and they and they continue to do great work. The best ones that I know, if if the founders of that organization that might have come from the states or some or somewhere else, Europe or somewhere. If they were to leave, that thing would still keep going. Because yeah, they, and, it, and it's and it's so that. difficult, Daryl, because you know we're dealing with we're dealing with with 
cultures that have not really been very much empowered other than farming and, you know, raising cattle. And there's, you, you know, there's not a lot of responsibility. So you're you're bringing on you're bringing in a Western mindset, and that is that is a whole. You're, so you're talking major cultural change. This is not a simple thing. And uh, let's come back to that after we take a brief break, and we'll we'll come back to that with some other ideas about types of giving. So we'll take a break right now. This is Charlie Hedges, and you are listening to the next chapter with Charlie. And I am on the phone with veteran philanthropical international expert Daryl Larson. And we are talking about the very challenging concept of when helping hurts, and that if we just give money without teaching. Or, 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 um, not so much teaching, but encouraging empowerment of the local communities to take charge of their own communities. We are almost doing them a disservice, and we had just ended up talking about. You'll have to remind me what we were talking about that I want to go on yeah. with, Daryl. We're just talking about, you know, what it's like to, to build capacity. And if, if we were to leave, you know, if like we go in or someone goes in as a founder and, and they were to leave, would the things that we're doing continue on because there is capacity built in the local level? And, you know, that's easier said than done. It takes a lot of work and a lot of effort to be able to, um, to, to go on that journey and to, to value other cultures input and their ability and esteem them and invite them into the process and walk side by side with them and, and, um, you know, take them on that kind of a journey. And, and actually, you know, in, in a sense, you, you hand the keys over to them and, and they're able to, to, to sustain these things. And, and in our specific case, uh, how do you do that with water, right? How do you do that with water wells when you drill them and, are there teams on the ground that when you leave have the, the ability and the capacity to, you know, and the foresight to, to save a little bit of, of money? That's a, that's a process all, all by itself is to teach, you know, concepts like group savings and village and those kind of things. But are there people on the ground that actually can fix those wells? And repair well, them? Uh, you know, I'll tell you what we do, and it's, it's, a, it's a big, it's a, it's a process. As you know, any, anytime you get into large corporate or government or international affairs, acronyms are everything. You know, you've got to, mm-hmm. you know, you have, it, it's like, it's like um, um, alphabet soup with all these things. And there's a... There's an acronym called CBMS, which is Community-Based Management System. And what we do with our wells, for instance, when we drill a well, we send our people and we create a water user committee. Water user committee is about 11 people. The majority needs to be women because women are the primary collectors of the water. And they see that it's done sanitary, that it's given distributed equally, that there are times when the well is open, times when the well is closed. But they also create a a bank account, a a uh, amount of of money that is that is very low. We we that that costs the individual user. 50 shillings, and I have to, let me, I think it's three cents that it costs them for a um, five gallon bucket of water. And all that money, it's not, it's not, we're not making the money. The community is not making the money. They are saving the money for when the well becomes, a part breaks on it and it becomes non functional. They have the resources to employ a well mechanic. To come out and and repair them. Now, that in and of itself sounds great. 
That sounds like, oh, man, yeah. you guys have really got it together. But you have to understand that people are not always in communities for forever, so water user committees members could change, and in two or three years they have not been trained by us, and we just don't have the capacity to go back and train, retrain everybody all the time. So, you, you know, you're, you're really, there, there's a battle at hand that we, we recognize that we try to do the best we can, um, but you, you, have, you have cultural issues, and especially in rural, rural areas, you know, you don't have, you don't have the urban, urban government agencies, you know, you just have a gr- group of people with a chief and, and a couple of officials, and, and they're the ones that are in charge of everything. But we do what we can to train, to train people to, they take ownership. And we have contracted with a, um, a well maintenance, preventive maintenance organization that, are, that is partnering with us. We're just starting this year with them. We're very excited that they will encourage and work with the people to set up a bank account and get all of the monies involved. And when they do that, this group will do preventive maintenance. They will, they will visit every well once a month to check out to see, is a seal looks like it's on its way out? So in, instead of waiting until it breaks, they repair, they do preventive maintenance, they replace it right away so we don't have a non-functioning well. So that is, yeah. and, and they're with them for years, they're with them for a minimum of five years that they're working with them. So we're very excited about that, but we, we do really believe in community empowerment. We work very hard at it. Yeah, I know you guys do a great job. I saw it firsthand. I got to be with you guys in January and uh, over in Uganda, and it was it was really impressive to see how you guys have everything set up. And, uh, you know, your donors have to be really, really pleased to be a part of uh, something like that where, they're, you know, the ROI on everything is just being done so well and so inclusive of the locals and everything. So it was really good to see firsthand for myself. Yeah, and we have, and we're just so fortunate that we have such excellent staffing in in Uganda. We have only one expatriate. He's our country director. He's from Romania, and everybody else is national. Our deputy country director is Ugandan, and everybody in our you know in our operation is Ugandan. So everybody is local. It's not a bunch of it's not a bunch of excuse me, but white people going in there fixing everything. This is, so it's, it's local, so they have, they have much more credibility, and they can, they can speak a language that we can't speak, not only the actual language, but, but they're much more, um, they're listened to more than we are. Now, what I, wanna, what I wanna talk about, and this was something I added when, I don't know if, you, if you're going to approve of this, but you told me about two types of giving that are very important. I added a third yeah. one because I I, mm-hmm. I, I read it. I, I didn't just make it up. I, I read it, but I want to make sure you agree with it. There's, there's you know, there's, this is simplifying it, but there's three essential types of giving internationally to to various situations. The first one is relief giving. And relief giving is when you have sort of environmental catastrophic tsunamis, floods, earthquakes, you know, whatnot. That just needs, there's no development. You're not, you're wasting your time with development. You need to give them money so they can rebuild and they can get right back into the, into the game. Yeah, or, re, or resources. And one of the premises of When Helping Hurts is if you try to give a development effort in a relief context, so development has a lot of red tape and a lot of planning and a lot of processing and all that stuff. But relief, relief needs relief right now. Like my water went out or we had a tsunami or we had an earthquake or whatever. I need food now. I need resources now. It doesn't need red tape. And so if we try to give it a development effort with a lot of planning and all that kind of stuff, it doesn't help. It hurts. Yeah, we had, we had the, the same, same case with, with Louisiana in Louisiana. 
We we yeah. just had to help rebuild. There was no let's create these infrastructures. We got to get things working, then we can start working on infrastructure. Right, and consequently, the, the I mean, the same kind of thing happens when you go into a place and you and you have an expectation that you want things to last and sustain, but you give more of what I would say a relief effort. And so you go, let's say, in the context of water filters or something like that, you go in, you take a water filter, you drop it off, you do minimal training, and um, you haven't focused on behavior change and all of the things that it takes, you know, to, to adapt to, uh, to any new technology. And so we kind of drop things off, go, and give a relief effort, and we expect long-lasting results, and that doesn't work either. That, that, that doesn't help. We've, we've taken donors' money. And we've really, in a sense, wasted it because we haven't focused on changing the behaviors of people, which takes time, follow up, continuing education, all of all. Of and more things. resources. It takes it takes a, a bunch. Of, it's it's easy it to does. go in and drill a well and run. Yeah, you know, and, and you've got more. and you've got three hundred abandoned wells in one in one district. Yeah. So on on one level, you would say, oh, it costs more to do development. I would I would argue the opposite. It costs more to do relief because when you go in and do relief, you go in and spend all the money, and then it doesn't last. Sometimes it doesn't last very long at all, and then you have to go back and do it again, and then do it again, and do it again. That's it true. Again. That you know, it, it you know, I think that's a good point. And what you're getting into is what I got into my my second one. So forgive me for adding one. That's why I said relief. I wanted to make relief strictly contingent upon sort of disaster and catastrophe. And then the one I read about alleviation of poverty is taking the relief concept and putting it into alleviating poverty by just going in and throwing money at it and walking away. And so, it, it, you know, it's just it's semantical. So so we can still deal with relief. It doesn't make a difference to me. But I, I so agree with you that you just can't go in and throw money at it because it is it is striking me. And only now, after after considering it for... A little while now, and 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 just recently hit me. It really smacks of colonialism. It it really does. It it makes it makes a total dependence on an outside resource. It doesn't. It does not develop any kind of internal self confidence, self determination that we are that we believe in our capacity and our capability to deal with our own problems now that we have these now that we have these tools and these resources like a filter or a well or yeah. who knows what all we're talking water so we know you know we're very familiar with those areas that yeah. that they can w- take charge of that rather than a colonial comes in and says, we'll put it in. If it's broken, we'll come in and fix it. So everybody is depending on the deep pockets that's coming in. They're, you know, the, the, the rurals and the communities and the villagers think, you know, why do we have to do anything if deep pockets is going to come and take care of it? And it just, it just doesn't work that way. And it, it is, I, I believe, so much in the developmental and, yeah. we, and and we are, we actually do a disservice, I think, to people living in third world countries because um, you know they, they they live in different conditions, um, and oftentimes poverty is about choices and opportunity, and and they just don't have opportunity. But that doesn't that doesn't mean they're dumb or or they they don't know things or, or whatever. They're they're actually quite brilliant and quite smart and and very. Um, capable. Uh, I think that going in, you know, everybody wants to use their gifts and their abilities and their resources, not everybody, but I mean, the idea would be that we would all uh, uh, strive for that, right? Where we would take the giftings that we have, the resources that we have, and be able to use those around the world to make a difference. But I think that needs to come with a healthy dose of humility and a healthy dose of uh, esteeming other people uh, we need to get rid of the hero concept that we're, you know, out to be the heroes of the world, but that we're actually there to to be uh, cooperative and 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 to and serve cooperative efforts. Yeah, and to serve really. And so we don't when we go in, 
with with uh, the attitude that we're here to serve. What, do, what how can we best serve you? Uh, how can we best help meet your needs? What are those needs? What does that look like? Um, I think that goes a long way um, towards respecting the the brilliant, bright people that live in countries that maybe they don't have as many opportunities with education and different things like that we have have experienced maybe in our country uh, in the U.S. But but we should we should have a very healthy dose of humility as we go in and uh, not go in with that, you know, we're here to save the day. Yeah, and that we are all equal. We're not, we're not the, yeah. you know, we're not the savior of the world Americans or the savior yeah. of the world Europeans yeah. or, or whatever, you know, pick any nation you want to pick, that saving yeah. the world Chinese. You know, we're not, we're not any of those that we are. I love your, your idea of humility, that we do go on with humility respect, acceptance, you, you, you know, it's amazing how far respect and, and, and to goes. Be oh, absolutely, and to be absolutely, is, yeah. that, is that you're in a learning end. But, you know, I was going to say, to go in with respect. I find when I go into communities or rural villages, and I respect the elders and respect the leadership, you, you know, you can tell that they're, that they are genuinely moved by it to the degree that we can translate you know, not knowing each other's language, but, you know, you're just not going in, you know, looking for the special seat, the front seat of the, like, like, you, you know, it says in the Bible, don't take the, don't t- take the front seat at the banquet so you're pushed to the back seat. Take the back seat and be invited up to the front seat. And, yeah. and that's kind of the attitude that, that we need to go with. But you know what strikes me is that, to our listeners now many of our listeners cannot get involved they just don't have the time to get involved in the developmental aspects that they are really their primary gift is their treasure their primary gift is writing a check that 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 is the one thing they can do but i would really encourage everybody to investigate the nonprofit or the NGO or the source that you're giving money to see are they development or are they throwing money at things? Because the more we just throw money at things, the less effective it is. We we have to train people, encourage people, build up their it's you know, I've been reading later, I thought it was esteem, but that's a very kind of very American idea. It's to build up their their aspiration and their self uh, determination to take care of themselves. That that we can take care of themselves because we are talking about very proud individuals, and I don't mean in the negative sense of pride, but I mean they are proud that they have farms and they they're proud that they have that they have cattle that they're raising and they could feed their their children this is a mark of this is a mark of of success in society and if we can if we can assist that at the same time keep people keep people um healthy we're really doing a job and so i would i would encourage givers to really check out this aspect it's not an aspect that you even think of but think of check out this aspect is your charity whether it's a dingo or 501c3 or or whatever are they developers or are they relievers and yeah um, and again you know there's uh there is room for both most certainly um you know when you have relief you, there are certain charities that that's what they do. But that's emergency, uh, isn't it, Daryl? Isn't that more of an emergency is, in is. line with disaster? It, it, yeah, that's a different it, kind. That's a you know. Let's you're right. Let's be clear on that. That's a that's a whole. We're talking. We're talking totally different things. We're talking yeah. the places that we have an opportunity for a longer term impact. Sure. Yeah. 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 In that sense. So you. Yeah. If if you. Again, go in, uh, throw money at something, and don't um, change behavior, or you don't work with the people or whatever. 
uh, that can oftentimes not translate very good <laughs> in a in a culture. I tell you, just to give you an idea of the it it is it is to develop these programs. It is really easy to be. Now I want to go back to my alleviation of poverty rather than relief, because relief is kind of disaster-related. But when we just go throw money at a project, we build a well and bolt, um, that's really easy. You know, we we do a well for $6,000, which is $4,000 under most everybody else's price, if not more than that. A thousand people are impacted. We're now doing studies with another company that you're working for, as if you don't work for enough companies. But another company we, you're working with, and we're really doing very sound data collection. And by fourth quarter, end of the year, we're going to have a lot of data that shows, like you, that shows the decrease in diarrhea, the health, and 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 that we're, be, we're going to be able to do that. But that requires... A lot of effort, Daryl. I mean, that's not, you know, it's so easy to go in and drill a well and bolt. Instead yeah. of, if we do our wash, you know, our water sanitation and hygiene, that's a minimum of a nine-month educational process of teaching plus empowering, teaching people to take charge, what they take charge of, how they take charge of it. And then it takes a one, <coughs> excuse me. It takes one to two years to follow up on that. Sure. Yeah, it does, it, it is a lot of effort, and uh, again, it's 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 getting into the systems and uh, uh, taking the time to to uh, have the right resources and and taking the time and effort for continuing education and and really focusing on behavior change, all those kind of things. And it, it does take more work. It takes more resources actually to do it, but. I would say, again, you know, some people would say it's cheaper to go uh, where you just drill the well and you go away. Well, not really, because when the well breaks, you got to go in and now they need another one. And so you got to spend that 6000 again. So it's not really cheaper. It's, it's, uh, I would say it would be more short-sighted to think that you could go drop something off and expect it to sustain itself when you haven't dealt with all of the other things. Yeah, it's and, um, it's that way with it's that way with everything. It's, it, it's that way with you goods. Know. It's that way when we buy materials. You know, you can buy at a yeah. certain store and get a really discount price, and you're having to go and buy every six to nine months that thing over again. Whether you pay a, when you pay a higher price, it may last four or five years. Yeah, um, and it's the same in the U.S. You know, when we're dealing with other issues like homelessness and mental health and all of those kind of things, there's not a quick band aid for those things. It's it's you got to get down and dirty into the trenches to to love people and meet people where they are and and um, you know it, it's I, I've been on that road you know personally in my own life uh, maybe for another subject at another time but you know just working with with someone we had a we had a homeless guy that lived with us for about four out of the six years that he was alive in the last years of his life. And uh, most when we met him, almost every day was a bad day. And when when he passed away, almost every day was a good day. But I'll tell you, it was two steps forward, or one step forward, two steps back. A lot of days, it was. It's those things are hard work to to help with the transformation of life. But it's so worth it and so rewarding. Um, whether or not it's wells or filters or in our own backyards, uh, to put in the kind of effort that really is transformational. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I just don't even want to get into the subject, but here I go. But it is, it is true in the United States that we have to be careful. There is a place that we need to throw money at certain things, but are we really doing cultural developmental work that is really necessary, or are we just dealing with symptoms and not causes. When you're throwing money at something, you're dealing with symptoms. You're not dealing with causes. And and those are issues that we need to all we all need to ask ourselves and and but we're talking about developing world countries and we know for a fact that I, I totally agree with you. It's more expensive 
to do the throw the money in both than it is to spend a little bit more up more money up front and have this thing last longer. Daryl, you do you just do fine work. You you are so knowledgeable in this subject and I want to thank you for coming on the air to talk about this because um this is the first time I've even begun to broach such a subject as this and 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 I think it's 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 really important and it it was your idea and I I love your idea. Thank you so much for that. I I, I really appreciate it. No, it's my my pleasure. Anytime, um, I love uh, I love the work that you guys are doing. It's um, for your listeners who have been listening for a long time, and your donors that have been listening for a long time, and know the work of Wells of Life. Um, it's the real deal, and uh, it's I've seen it firsthand with my own life. So, what you guys are doing, I my hats off to you and and the great efforts that you guys are making in, in uh, the people's lives in Uganda. It's awesome. And, you know, and I have to throw in the commercial, if you want to get a hold of us, it's just simple, wellsoflife.org, and we will explain everything we do. And Sawyer Filters, what are you, sawyerfilters.org? No, no, it's uh, sawyer.com. Sawyer, well, S-A-W. it's a dot .com, sawyer.com. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put them both yeah. in the show notes so people can look them up and, and see the different services and how we're both giving water to poor people. So um, thank you so much for spending time with me today, Daryl. You're welcome, Charlie. My pleasure. And I also want to thank our listeners for tuning in to The Next Chapter with Charlie. And be sure to check us out at our website, thenextchapter.life. And until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.